This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Catherine Druckmann and I talk with Dan Lorenz, who is the co-creator of SigStore, which is a new standard for signing, verifying, and protecting software, and the president and CEO of ChainGuard, which is a company that puts this to work, protecting the supply chain of open source software, which is massive, complicated, and really important. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 712, recorded Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. Software Supply Chain Security. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat that lets you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process and what they've learned from their experiences. Search for Code Comments in your podcast player. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. I'm joined this week by Catherine Truck, who will appear in a second. Um, there she is in, in, in Houston, Texas. And I'm here yep. in, uh, yep, you're still there. And um, I'm in New York, where there is a deceptively positioned air conditioner, for those of you who can see me uh, behind my head, which has been idle for a couple of months. There's some Christmas lights. <laughs> next to it. This is not my usual place, but I don't have one right now. So how are you doing, Catherine? I am doing pretty well. Um, sorry, <laughs> I was just looking at my dead plant. Uh, <laughs> I am woefully underprepared for holidays, so that's a thing. Um, but I'm really excited about this because um, I'm talking a lot about this topic lately. So this will be a good, um, I think I'll learn a lot, which is nice. It's always nice to come here and learn new things. So, so, and the topic being, <laughs> oh, are we teasing it? Sorry, so you are, I think we're gonna you, get... are, you are more prepared than I am on this. So, okay, the topic being a uh, software supply chain security, which is, I think, on yeah. a lot of people's minds right now. Excellent. So, so then, so, so, so let's get into it. Our, our guest today is Dan Lorenz. He's, um, he's the CEO and uh, president of Chain Guard among other things, an expert on software cha- <laughs> supply chain security. I think you don't often think about a supply chain. Anyway, welcome, welcome to the show, Dan. Where, how are you doing? There I'm he good, is. thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're in for an adventure and, and, today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and where are you on, on Earth at this point? <laughs> good question. Um, I'm just outside of Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, good. Good. So we're all, we're all in the in this in the center of the country in the east are preparing for a, a bad cold snap supposedly oh it's gonna get warnings. bad here but yeah in texas Our, it's, it's gonna get down to like 40. <laughs> no no it's actually something. gonna be something like 16 which houston is just not prepared really? for oh, yeah, yeah houston no. and our pipes are not we're, we're gonna have to turn the water off for a couple of days in our house like we're just gonna camp and uh all right wow. i'm hoping that my jasmine on the fence doesn't die completely it's just oh it's yeah terrible. no jasmine jasmine's not good for that so so dan t- t- tell us how you got to where you are in 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 this adventure and kind of frame it up for us to to start off the show sure yeah thanks for having me today so uh yeah i started this company chain guard with a few others a little over a year ago we got started back in october of last year but before that i was an engineer at google for about nine years where I was doing a bunch of stuff from open source uh, infrastructure security, developer tooling, and then kind of toward the end, the intersection of all of that stuff with uh, open source and supply chain security. So I've been at this for a while. Uh, the topic's recently gotten very exciting with things like the attack on solar winds, the massive log for shell vulnerability last year, and tons and tons of typo squatting attacks that we see on popular open source package managers each week. So it's been a, a fun journey, and we're doing a bunch of open source ourselves and products to help combat this across the industry. Um, could you, uh, since you brought it up, I wondered if you could sure. uh, tell us what typo squatting attacks are. Sure. There was actually just one yesterday uh, that was all over the news today on um, Sentinel One. If you've heard of that company, uh, but a typo squatting attack is kind of a social engineering style trick 
where an attacker, so there's a bunch of different ways to do type of squatting in a bunch of different places you can do it in. But in the context of open source and supply chain security, typically what will happen is somebody will take a popular company or a popular open source project and then change the name slightly, whether they put in a typo or something slightly more nefarious, like change an abbreviation or something like that. And then upload another version of that same package to something like PyPI or NPM or RubyGems. And that other version is pretty close to the original one, except it has some malicious code inside of it. So that's what happened yesterday with Sentinel-1. Somebody uploaded a package to PyPI pretending to be some kind of SDK or client library for Sentinel-1, but it actually had nothing to do with the company. And the end goal then is to trick people into downloading it, thinking it's the real version. And then at that point, your malicious code gets to do whatever it wants, whether it's steal passwords, mine bitcoins, or something even worse. Those happen yeah. pretty often, and there's very little you can do about it. Yeah, the pretty often thing is is the the scary part these days. Um, so, I you know I have so many questions for you actually, <laughs> but one of my first one. Um, so how is the, the the how is the recent government uh, attention, let's say, uh, changed the the landscape of the work that you do? Right, there was the uh, executive order on cybersecurity that was last year. Um, there is the open source security legislation that is sort of you know, in, in progress, I don't know, maybe not in progress, but out there. <laughs> um, so, so a lot of it, I think, focuses on open source security. So that's, that's, I guess, kind of part two of the question. So there, there seems to be a, maybe a hyper focus. And I wonder, is that because people realize that basically all software is open source software now? I mean, not all, but a considerable chunk of it. I mean, how, you know, is there software that doesn't use any open source uh, components anymore? Um, so I, I just wonder if the scrutiny and, uh, you know, over open source software, is that fair? Shouldn't it just be sort of instead of the problem with open source software, maybe it's the problem with software? So those are two yeah, questions in there in a very. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to those two questions, too. Um, yeah, so I think you, you started off by asking, you know, how is the government attention and legislation affecting the landscape. Yeah, I think typically if you ask a software engineer, especially an open source maintainer, if they want the government paying attention, uh, you know, that's a terrifying thought um, for most <laughs> yep. folks. But, uh, you know, really what these attacks over the last couple of years have proven, though, is that you know, governments themselves are also at risk. They also use open source and they have to start paying attention to this area. So uh, it's, it's a reality that folks are starting to learn to live with. Um, you referred to the executive order uh, from the Biden administration last, I think it was last May, uh, something like that, yeah. on you know, securing America's cyber security posture, digital infrastructure, all of that fun stuff, of which open source and supply chain was a huge component. Folks get confused a lot when looking at these things. Like you, you can't have a an executive order that says write secure code, yeah, be right? secure, do things securely. It, I wish it were that simple. Um, but instead, kind of the nice. way these regulations work is, oh yeah, here it is. Um, the way these regulations work is by kind of instructing other agencies to instruct other agencies to look into things and produce recommendations, and then other folks to start you know adopting and following those recommendations. So a lot of the fallout in the last year or so that we've seen from this was uh, NIST. Um, the standards making body uh, inside of the US government put together a huge framework for how to develop software securely. So this is kind of that shift. Instead of the software itself having to be secure at the end, the actual development process for itself should be secure because that's kind of how supply chains work. And if you're not doing that securely and you're building out unsecured laptops and using unsecured CI servers, then uh, attackers can find those. So that's called the SSDF or Secure Software Development Framework. And again, folks like NIST can't make people follow any of these. They just publish these specifications. Right. So we're and kind it's of also at the very final... long. <laughs> yes. Yes. Incredibly long. Massive. <laughs> They're massive. Um, yeah. So we're kind of at the end game now, I think, of these regulations rolling out, where the final step in a lot of this process is that the government can exercise their power as you know, the largest consumer of software in the world or one of the largest buyers of software to start requiring people that sell them software to follow these practices. That's typically how it works. Um, and so we're right at that stage now with things uh, like the NDAA or National Defense Authorization Act that just got passed last week, which includes a bunch of regulations around cybersecurity, as well as the new omnibus bill, which is, I think, only out today, actually, uh, folks are trying to scramble through 4,500 pages um, of legislation, which is tied to funding. 
So it's been it's been fast in terms of government time, I would say, you know, going from an executive order to this in like a year and a half. But it's you know pretty feels pretty slow on the outside as folks are waiting for all of this to trickle around. The second half of that question, actually, do you want to jump in there before I go to the second half of your question around open source yeah. itself? No, no. I mean, I, I, I did just want to say one thing about the length and the, the yes. massiveness of these these documents. I, I wonder if that's a if that's a bit of a deterrent or it, it makes them less useful. I, I've wondered that. I, I read some interesting criticism, you know, online about about that. And I am I would actually plug here the work of the Open SSF and in, in, mm-hmm. in releasing some concise guides. But um, yeah, I wonder if you thought about that before you go into the open source part. Yeah, yeah, the length is always fun. Um, nobody reads them, you know, in the, the actual That's like read word for word and, and tries to follow it. But yeah, it, it ends up starting to get distilled down into scores and rubrics and frameworks and prescriptive guides. You mentioned the Open SSF a couple of times. That's so the Open Source Security Foundation, um, which is part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and they've kind of been at the forefront of a lot of this work, even you know, writing recommendations and participating in the process by which NIST came up with these recommendations. Um, and so they have a couple of different efforts going to help condense that into smaller prescriptive steps. One of those is the SALSA framework or SLSA, um, which provides, you know, kind of boils it down to four levels, levels one through four. And it's very easy to see what you have to do to get your supply chain to level one, to level two, to level three, to level four. To hopefully save you time in not having to read hundreds and hundreds of boring pages <laughs> of specifications. <laughs> Um, the open source angle, though, you mentioned is, is a really interesting one. Um, you asked, you know, is there software out there that's not open source or doesn't use open source? Um, all the stats I've seen say somewhere between like 90 and 98% of the code in most modern applications is open source. Um, yeah. Something like 98% of organizations surveyed say they're using it. And I think the other 2% got confused or clicked the wrong button or something like that. When filling <laughs> exactly. It <out>. um, <laughs> it's impossible to not be using open source. Um, and it's kind of like, I look at it as like the, the kind of tip of the iceberg analogy. Um, the little proprietary part most people write themselves and don't release is just that, that tip of the iceberg. And you have this massive iceberg underneath rise of all of the open source code to get you up and running. And that uh, all code has bugs. Um, open source code is no different. The more code you're using, the more bugs you're going to find. And some of those bugs have security implications. So that's where the kind of open source security angle comes from. You see vulnerabilities, you know, constantly, stuff like uh, log for shell last year was one of the biggest ones in recent memory for most folks. Uh, but not knowing what is under the water, not knowing what's kind of beyond the tip of the iceberg is where folks are struggling today. You said, you know, it's not really an open source security problem, maybe it's a, a software problem. I like to take that a little bit further, right? There's nothing bad about open source. Open source security is actually better than proprietary code security by pretty much every measure. Um, the problem is in how organizations consume open source, though. So mm. if you look at log for shell again as an example, it was fully patched by those maintainers within a week or two. You could say all you want about underfunding and understaffing and all of that, and we should do better. But they did their job within a week or two. And then you see stats last week on the anniversary of log for shell where 70% of organizations were still vulnerable to it. You know, that to me oh, isn't wow. an open source yeah. problem. That's a corporation, uh, the way you're using open source problem. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. If you're not responding, if you're not taking these gifts that are thrown out into the, into the uh, public, if you're not accepting them, the fixes, then um, yeah, you're going to leave yourself open. That's, that's a good, that's a good point. So something that you mentioned in your intro, actually, I, I think you did anyway. Um, I wanted to talk about identity and the the concept of of identity as it relates to signing software and 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 trust. So, could you talk about that a little bit? Why is identity verification so important to um, supply chain security? Yeah, identity that is a, a really deep uh, topic. I know you both have a lot of background in um, <laughs> identity. <Yeah>. Is <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah, I think identity is really tricky in open source in particular, but it's tricky, you know, for everything. Um, but in open source, a lot of times folks don't know the identities of maintainers. They don't pay attention to any of this. You're just grabbing code off of the internet and picking it up and using it. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to help improve that and help maintainers, you know, sign their code to make sure that when people grab it, they know they're getting it from the right source. Um, this happens in companies quite often, you know, companies have corporate code signing certificates. Open source is a little bit behind there because the whole identity world is trickier. 
it's a really tough privacy question in open source, kind of the way I look at it. Um, you might not necessarily care who the maintainer of a particular package is. You just want to know that it's that same person over time, or if it changes, that it changed on purpose. And it wasn't one of these typo squatting or package repository or GitHub account takeover style attacks. And so there's a lot going on in that space to help folks you know, maintain these kind of persistent identities, but without necessarily you know, taking photocopies of their passports and uploading them to GitHub along with every single release of software. Oh, I think Doc may have a question. Oh, he's muted. Actually, actually, I do, and I was on mute there for a second. Sorry. I'm, Sorry, I, 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 I'm I, I missed I'm the chat there for a second. I'm muting New York while I'm sitting here. Um, okay, so Dan, um, you know, I know, I know there's a role that Sigstore plays in this. It's a standard um, for doing the work that you do. Tell us what your involvement with that is and how it relates to what you're doing with ChainGuard. Sure. Yeah, so the Sigstore project is a set of open source projects and some also some infrastructure which makes it a little unique but i can get into that uh in a little bit but uh but the overall goal of all of this is to make code signing really really easy and free for open source maintainers if you're familiar with, with what let's encrypt did for tls across the internet um that's kind of the same approach we're trying to take with sigstore except for code signing rather than tls uh, and https certificates the infrastructure allows you to request these short-lived certificates that are only good for a couple minutes to use to sign your code. You authenticate yourself by logging into most common identity systems, so say Gmail or GitHub or GitLab or any of these other common identity providers, and you sign your code with that. So it might be an email address or a GitHub account or something else that uh, is known to the users and contributors of that project. Uh, and by doing this, it's all free. You don't have to worry about keeping keys around like you might have had to before with PGP. You don't have to worry about losing them or anything. And uh, anybody can get up and running with it in a couple of minutes. So this project uh, got started a few years ago before we started the company back when I was at Google. Um, and it's part of the OpenSSF today. So we're working on integrating it with most popular language package managers and ecosystems and tools. Uh, in the container space, uh, all across the CNCF, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, at our company, we're using a lot of that tooling as well. So we have products and systems that help you start doing that inside of corporate environments. That same kind of open source technology that's free for PyPI and NPM um, needs some tweaks to work behind firewalls and inside of enterprises. So we have a bunch of stuff in that space. So that kind of ties into the identity question we were talking about before. Sorry about that, boy. I'm writing, writing mute at home. I have, just have a button. I hold it down and it's muted. I pick it up and it's not muted here. I'm looking at the Zoom window. Sorry about that, folks. Um, uh, th th there's, th there's a term that I've heard more and more over the recent years around in the identity world, um, which is about provenance. And mm -hmm. two questions about that. Is it provenance or provenance? <laughs> and then the other is... Um, and, and the other is, um, and the way open source works with code coming from so many places that get put in containers and other things like this, how important or easy it is it to keep on top of what the provenance of something is when really you're trying to guard what happens along the way? And maybe your work actually takes that off the table so customers aren't as worried about it. So just want to see if you can address that issue. Sure. Yeah, he, you mentioned the the magic provenance word. Um, I've heard it pronounced a bunch of different ways, including like uh, a common uh, misconception there. Uh, people say providence a lot, which is you know a city in Rhode Island near where I live. It has nothing to do with all of these. Um, but yeah, uh, provenance um, is kind of where uh, say that that piece of code came from. An example I like to use uh, is you know, most folks hopefully know that. Uh, here, let me grab one from my desk. Most folks know if you find a you know a USB thumb drive uh, on the <laughs> in the parking lot or sidewalk outside your work, you are not supposed to pick that up, bring it inside, and plug it into your computer. Um, hopefully, most security folks have, have scared people away from doing that. Um, but when you look at it, um, running pip install on some random package or uh, npm install on some random package uh, isn't really that much different. You're still just kind of taking code from somebody you've never met. You have no real reason to trust them. Uh, downloading it and then running it on your computer or you know, even worse, sticking it into a container and sending that into your production data center. Um, so 
provenance and a lot of this tooling is kind of taking that concept and saying, well, why can't we plug in that USB thumbstick? Uh, look at the code in there and then actually trace that back from that you know, compiled binary back to the build system that it was built on, back to the commit and the Git repo that it was built from, back to the maintainer that wrote that commit. We don't really have those breadcrumbs today in a lot of these open source ecosystems. And cryptographic signatures and stuff like SigStore are a way to start building up that trail of breadcrumbs in a way that you can verify it later. We're not all the way there, but uh, we're getting close, I think. I actually have a question about SigStore, but first I have to sure. let, uh, let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small reminder in the code, a code comment to help others learn from your work, this podcast takes that idea by letting you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from whiteboard to development, and none of us can do it alone. The host, Burr Sutter, is a Red Hatter and a lifelong developer advocate and a community organizer. In each episode, Burr sits down with experienced technologists from across the industry to trade stories and talk about what they've learned from their experiences. Um, I subscribe to it, by the way. I really like the deep learning episode. It goes into how companies themselves, like Intel, actually use deep learning to help their process internally. It's good stuff. Episodes are available anywhere you list a podcast and at redhat.com slash code comments podcast. It's all one word, code comments podcast. Search for code comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to code comments for their support. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some notes here about, um, you know, along with prominence, what's the difference between the way you're doing it with your work and the way it's done in the all or mostly proprietary world? Do you just leave it up to an Oracle or you leave it up to one of those big guys to take care of the whole thing? Or are learnings moving back and forth between these two worlds or are the worlds entirely no longer separate the way they once were? Yeah, uh, you know, if you look at it and you look at the history of code signing, um, you know, stuff like PGP has been around in open source for, for decades. And you've been able to use it in some large projects have, but it hasn't really seen widespread adoption. Uh, but if you look at, say, the proprietary worlds, um, you do kind of see these small circles or walled gardens that do have pretty good code signing set up. Um, some examples there are say, like drivers for Windows. Microsoft requires those to be signed uh, before they can be executed. Um, similar things for like the Apple App Store for phones or the Android Store for Android. Uh, but th none of this was ever really set up general purpose. Um, a lot of those concepts there around like, is this signed? Yes, then it's safe to run. Um, they're great for establishing some types of, of trust or barriers, but they leave a lot of problems unsolved. One great example there was you know, the attack on solar winds we started by talking about. Um, SolarWinds knew those certificates had been compromised as part of the attack, but uh, the PKI the, um, infrastructure there for, for signing and the certificates made it so hard for them to revoke that certificate uh, that it took them over a year to do so because it would have kind of bricked or broken a bunch of installations that weren't compromised. Um, and so there's a lot of improvements to be made across you know, both open source and closed source kind of these proprietary app store worlds. Provenance takes it a little bit further too. Right? The, the typical code signing model that gets criticized a lot is if it's signed, it's good. If it's not signed, it's bad. Um, that whole concept of provenance you were talking about is more about attaching semantics. So uh, you can sign something as it gets built and you're not necessarily saying it's safe or not safe. You're just saying, hey, I built it on GitHub using this GitHub action. You're kind of stating and putting a bunch of facts on the record that somebody else can evaluate later. The only thing you're saying is that this statement is true. It's, you're not saying it's good or bad or safe or unsafe. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a question. Maybe others would be interested. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a bit about SigStore. Can you kind of lay out for us what what does it actually help prevent and what are its limitations? <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, SigStore really, really is targeted just at that kind of authenticated metadata about software case. So it lets you make those claims. Um, it lets you say, I, you know, with my email address, sign off on this saying it's a real release, or I uh, built this using GitHub Actions from this commit. 
Um, it lets you put all these on the record. It lets people find them. And it's really great for that use case. Um, I mentioned before that there's a bunch of open source projects with SigStore and also a bunch of infrastructure, uh, which is a little bit unique. So a lot of projects just come with something you can download and run. SigStore has that, but it also comes with access to this free community run public good infrastructure um, instance of SigStore that you can interact with. Um, that contains a certificate authority you can get certificates from, as well as a bunch of transparency logs where this stuff gets stored and can be looked up from. Uh, these transparency logs are great because once you sign something, you can put it on the record. Anyone can find it. You can't really change it later or take it back. Um, but the downside there, uh, you know, the big limitation is that everything is on this public record. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're trying to run some of this infrastructure internally or inside of your company um, and you're building code that you might not be shipping, um, then you probably don't want to be putting every single build of your internal backend system on this public log where anybody can read it. Um, or you might not want to take a dependency on that service for something running inside of your data center. So there are different ways you can run parts of it inside or parts of it outside, but that's kind of the biggest limitation today. It's both a, a benefit and a drawback. Okay. Um, I wonder, could you also talk about the underlying software that powers Sigstore? There are other pieces that fit into it, let's say, Fulcio, Recore, that kind of things, and, and mm -hmm. how all of these things f fit together in the <laughs> um, kind of to tighten up the software lifecycle. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So I mentioned all those different components before. Those are some of their names. So the typical interaction model is somebody would download a, a client for SigStore. So depending on what type of stuff you're signing, um, if you're doing containers, you would download the, the cosign tool, it's called. Um, if you're uploading a Python package, there's a special version of that for Python. Or if you're doing NPM, um, some of that stuff is getting baked into NPM directly. So once you have that tool for signing and verifying, um, you just run the commands, uh, depending on how you're trying to sign your code, a browser window might pop open. You might click login um, with Google or login with Microsoft or something like that to get your identity. Um, and then uh, at that point, you get a certificate. So that certificate comes from the certificate authority, which is how this, this works uh, for most other ecosystems too. And that's called FULCIO, so F-U-L-C-I-O. That's the, the name of the certificate authority piece. Um, after you do all of that, the signatures, your SBOMs, the provenance, um, not the providence though, um, all that stuff gets <laughs> signed and then stuck into the transparency log. So a transparency log is a kind of a penned only database where you can add records and other folks can verify that records are in there, uh, but you can't tamper with them later. You can't delete them. You can't change them after they're in that log. Um, and that piece is called Recore, R-E-K-O-R. So there's a network of folks out there verifying that stuff only gets added to the log and doesn't, get, um, and nothing gets removed or modified. And then you as a user can check that log too and see a record of everything that you signed. So if all of a sudden something shows up in there that shouldn't be in there, uh, you don't remember say doing a release of that package that day, um, then it's a pretty good sign somebody stole your identity somewhere. And you can use that as a hint or the start of a process to go and recover. So those are kind of the three components of client, something like cosign, and then the certificate authority and the transparency log. But it's all set up in a way that's supposed to be developer friendly and you don't even necessarily have to know about it beyond clicking that login button every once in a while when you release a package. Uh, developer friendly is a is an excellent uh, phrase that we like to hear. <laughs> Actually, so I'm wondering, like, if I put myself in the shoes of a DevOps engineer, say, and I've, I've Let's assume I've spent a lot of time getting my my pipeline to some near perfect level of efficiency <laughs> in, a, in a perfect world. Um, how, how do I add this to my setup in the absolute easiest way possible without completely moving my cheese? Yeah, it depends kind of where that pipeline is and everybody's got different systems for it. Uh, but that's really the magic, the secret sauce here. Uh, we're trying to get it to where you shouldn't have to do anything other than click a button and say you want to use this. And Wonderful. if you're using GitHub Actions or GitLab Runner or Circle CI or some of these popular build systems, um, then you're almost at that world today, which is great. Um, the these systems should be transparent to you as a user, so it should be pretty easy to um, to get set up, and you shouldn't have to think about it after that. I think we're sort of seeing a shift from everybody running their own Jenkins build systems on old Mac Minis and closets to the people. <laughs> coalescing on a smaller number of more highly secured build systems like these. It's definitely a trade-off. Um, there's a little bit of centralization happening, uh, but overall, I think it's a net win for, for the industry for folks to be relying on stuff that's more actively looked after. That's, um, yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, easy to implement is, is the magic word there. 
Um, what are, what are the barriers to adoption? Are there? Um, <laughs> yeah, like the, just kind of the, the breadth of the space and the number of package managers and the number of build systems to integrate with. Um, it's easier to bring on, say, every user of a packet of a language ecosystem at once by integrating directly into that tooling than having everyone do it themselves. So that's the approach that we're taking. Just time, though. Uh, the project's only been around a couple of years and the adoption's kind yeah, of I was about to, impressed everyone. Yeah. It seems early, right? It's yeah. early to talk about uh, adoption quite yet, maybe. Although it seems to, you know, it seems to have some traction. Um, yeah. I don't know, there yeah, is a uh, what there's a landscape page right where you can <laughs> the we love those landscape pages don't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah you can kind of get a picture of, of who's using it and where and it's um it does it does have some nice traction right yeah yeah there's a landscape i think it's a, a tab on the open ssf landscape uh that shows projects that integrate with it or use it to sign their releases or um yeah uh let you verify stuff on the other end. So yeah, there, there's a bunch of different categories for it and tons of projects. And I think most notably stuff like uh, the Kubernetes project itself, which releases dozens and dozens of containers and binaries and manifests for every single platform under the sun uses it now. They're one of the, the heaviest lifts that we've had to do today just because of the, the size of their releases and complexity. So, so I was looking through your... Um you know, some of your white papers and projects and things. And, um, and you have these two products, uh, images and enforce, are they simultaneous for customers or sequential? How does that, how does it, how does what your cell work as people move into the, is become deeperly and more deeply involved as customers? Sure. Yeah. I'll explain the products a little bit. Um, kind of the images product, uh, is a, set of container images that we build um, and you can use those to either put your applications on top of to use to build your applications in your development pipeline or even some just kind of off the shelf apps that you can run in your infrastructure for web servers or frameworks or build systems that kind of thing um, those images uh, we rebuild them constantly we do all that salsa stuff with s bombs and provenance and signatures so when you use our stuff you can trace it back to the you know, commits and all of the code reviews and testing that was done for for each of the builds um, and then powering those uh, it's actually a really interesting um, new Linux distribution that we built called uh, Wolfie w o l f i um, and so we built this Linux distribution to be optimized for these container environments. So there's stuff like no kernel in there and uh, the packages are all built declaratively inside of containers themselves. So that when you get one of these, it has the bare minimum number of dependencies and uh, we can keep the vulnerability scan results incredibly clean. Um, so yeah, here's here's the little website. You can look up the SBOMs for each of the images. And if you scan them with your you know, vulnerability scanner of choice, uh, we should be down close to zero vulnerabilities on most days, which is a re refreshing uh, result compared to a lot of the, the other images out there where there are a lot more batteries included, have a lot more software, and it's not updated as frequently as ours. Um, so that's kind of the start of, of the journey for a lot of folks. <laughs> there's, there's there's a horn honking outside. You've got a you've got a delivery right outside. Yeah. I, just, uh, yeah, I know, I know. And, and I'm waiting for the buzzer to go off in the kitchen that says there's an Amazon guy at the front door. Somebody has to let him in, and it's not going to be me. Um, I, I have I have some other business questions, but first, um, I need to let everybody know that um, about Club Twit. Club Twit is our own thing here at the Twit Network. Uh, joining Club Twit is another great way to support our network. As a member, you get access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, as well as other great benefits. There's a uh, bonus Twit Plus feed, which includes footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit, as well as uh, bonus shows who started, such as Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, um, and uh, Ask Me Anything, and Fireside Chats with some of your favorite twist. Twit, twit guests and co-hosts um, as plus weekly listeners you may also be interested in checking out another club twit exclusive show the the untitled linux show with our own jonathan bennett it's a great show you should go check that out it's on weekends so sign up to join club twit for just seven dollars a month head over to twit.tv slash club twit and join today we thank you for your support 
I'm just thinking I, I, for provenance and provenance and pro, provenance and providence. Um, I wrote a book called the intention economy that was against the attention economy and everybody calls it the attention economy because that's what they hear. So it's hard. <laughs> anyway, English is a tough language. Um, I, I want to ask about a business model, which cause kind of, cause you always have to a- ask that. Um, do you have a free version? Do you start people out? I mean, it, it's a subscription of some sort, but you know, you have big companies that you're serving, you have little companies. How does that all work? Yeah. So the images themselves, all the code, all of that is open source, right? Um, you know, we're by building our own Linux distribution, we are you know, rebuilding all of the packages, stuff like curl and open SSL and everything that you're familiar with. So all of that is open source. All of our distribution is open source. Uh, and we have a free tier of the images as well. So a lot of the images, uh, we keep a, a free version that anyone can download. You don't have to sign up. You can just scan it or pull it. Um, and those are at um, github.com slash chainguard hyphen images slash images is the whole list of all of them. You can find them there. Um, the paid version uh, of all of that comes with you know, multiple versions and older support and LTS and other stuff that folks need for compliance. So we support a bunch of open source projects that use these things for free um, and then kind of charge companies for enterprise features and support for older stuff that they typically need. So pretty simple overall. Um, so I, I actually have another question and it's one of sure. my annoying multi-part questions. <laughs> Um, I read uh, a, a post you did, uh, a retrospective, so to speak, on, on on all the great things that have happened in open source security in 2022. And there are many, and and please, you know, feel free to to speak about those. But I also wondered um, what you hope to see next year. Now that we're at the end of the year, it's it's a nice time to talk about these things, and and what you hope to see. So that's part one, part two, and what role do you expect to play in in those things that you hope to see? And the third part is how can the open source community, how can people like me or anybody listening uh, get involved in making those things happen? Sure, all right, so part one was what do- What do you hope to see? I hope to see, yeah, what do I hope to see and then how am I gonna be a part and then how can you be a part? Um, okay, mm-hmm. so what do I hope to see? Um, you know, this year, 2022, uh, kind of this is definitely the year of the SBOM, I would say, the SBOM or Software Bill of Materials. Um, that was kind of the centerpiece of most of the legislation, most of the government regulation that we've seen going around. Um, and the whole idea with SBOM is that when you get a piece of software from someone, they should give you this standard format, machine readable document explaining all of the stuff in there, including all of the open source. So that way you can look for stuff like log4j, um, check the versions, scan all of the stuff inside for vulnerabilities and stop treating software as like a black box. Mm-hmm. Um, it's unfortunately, uh, it's a really hard topic. It's really complex. There's tons of different ways <laughs> software is built and bundled together and engineers love to bike shed about all of those little details and how to describe those relationships and how to name those components and all of that fun stuff. Um, and so a lot of the conversation has just been around, you know, what is an SBOM? How do we do them? Are they good? Do you have one? Do I have one? Do we need one? Does it secure me? That kind of stuff. So I hope next year is really the year that we can put them into action rather than just talking about them. Uh, it's way more than just binary too. Um, even if you have one, uh, we just released some data today about a lot of the, the existing ones out there. They're incomplete. They're inconsistent. They're missing things. They're not even you know in the correct standard format. Um, so I think hopefully next year we can actually get SBOMs in action and then start talking about the quality of them and making sure that they have enough data to be useful. We're doing a bunch of work there. We're trying to, you know, we're participating in the standards groups, updating the formats and you know, releasing those with all of our software for our customers as well. Uh, it's pretty easy to get involved um, if you're not doing SBOMs, then try and then complain and file bugs and send fixes <laughs> in for all the tooling to make it easy. Because like you said before, developer friendliness is going to be key here. And if, especially in open source, if people have to think about it, it's an extra step, then they're just not going to do it. Yeah, I, I think um, I think you were spot on there. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah, developers, we, you know, I think developers, I used to be one, <laughs> tend to sort of hyper-focus, you're hyper-focused all the time, right, on your problem, whatever the problem of the day or the month or the quarter or the year is, and you're so focused on that, it's so hard to get a, a big picture of what you're working on. And I think, you know, I'm very sympathetic with um, people presented with having to get on board with, yet, you know, add another add another thing that you're responsible yeah. for and then be and comply with and, 
And uh, but, you know, it, I, you know, I also think it's important because who among us have, has not been in dependency hell? And I think the, the visibility that this will this will give you is going to be a lifesaver to many eventually. But, um, may, you know, maybe we could talk actually a little since you brought up S bombs. I think that's something we haven't. <laughs> I said about the word. Yeah. <laughs> I know you said the word. So. So, um, yeah, I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about you know, let's say our, the, the current state and, and where we need to be with S bombs, especially when you talk about things like um, uh, U.S. government or other governments requiring S bombs of certain vendors. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of one of the big areas. Uh, we talked about some of the regulations at first and how uh, the government's going to start requiring this as it purchases software from, from vendors. This is one of the things they're going to start asking for this year. So when they buy your software, they might ask you to provide an S bomb alongside of it. And so that's you know, a list of all of the subcomponents inside of that software, um, down to you know all the transitive dependencies, the dependencies of those transitive dependencies, uh, which is really hard to do for, for folks in the beginning. They, they serve a couple use cases. Um, I think the biggest two, the easiest two to reason about um, are uh, number one, vulnerability management. So if you zoom back a year when log for shell happened, uh, everyone had to spend their holidays emailing every single one of their vendors, asking them if their software used log for shell and then how to remediate it if, uh, if it did use that effective version of log for today. SBOMs would let you skip that step hypothetically because they'd give you a list of everything inside and you wouldn't have to email them. You could just check those SBOMs to see if it's in there. Um, oh, uh, we're jumping ahead to VEX. Um, yeah, VEX is another awesome topic. Um, so VEX uh, is kind of step two I see here to the, the SBOM movement. Um, once SBOMs do get widespread, if they do get widespread, uh, folks are going to start seeing a lot more, right? It, it's a, a transparency conundrum when you can start seeing how the sausage is made and you see all of the stuff in these software packages that you're using. The obvious next step is to start scanning all of that for vulnerabilities. Um, and the whole software world is going to look much worse and much more insecure um, than it did you know, before this transparency was introduced. Um, VEX is kind of the complement there, where uh, VEX is a way for vendors to say that, yeah, we looked at all of those vulnerabilities in the scanner and we determined they're not applicable in this case because we compiled with different flags or we don't call a function that's vulnerable or some reason like that. So they're kind of a way to automatically quiet the scanners or automatically annotate those results uh, to help reduce the noise that's going to come from all this increased transparency. Is that enough? Did I answer it all? Yeah, I, I yeah, did, I and I was so. muting myself cool. again and swearing sure. I would never do it again, and I did it. Um, we have a, an active um, IRC back channel here, and uh, one question from there um, is, and there it is, uh, is how will you see customer inventorying and managing the life cycle of your certificates beyond and beyond signing certificates, what others are in a blind spot for customers? I probably didn't read that right, but... Um, but there's, there you go. Um, yeah, so the, the question is, how do we see folks managing the life cycle of certificates? Um, yeah, the yeah. the kind of shift I think that we're seeing, and this ties into a lot of the other federal buzzwords around zero trust, uh, but I think the shift we're seeing is kind of a movement away from these really long-lived secrets or long-lived private keys or long-lived certificates that you have to keep private and keep access to for a really long period of time. And if they leak, then the damages are long-lasting uh, as well. We're seeing a shift from that to much more shorter-lived, automatically rotating uh, tokens and credentials and certificates that you can get on demand um, as part of, you know, similar to most of the, the zero trust infrastructure movement. So instead of just doing everything with a password or some long access key that can get leaked, you're doing it with stuff that's automatically retrieved on demand. That's the general trend, not just for code signing, but for, for everything like that, dealing with cryptographic material. Yes, I was, <laughs> I was fishing from where, from where questions in the back channel, which is busy talking to itself about everything else at the same time. So let me ask a different question, which is um, you spent a lot of time at Google and I suspect it was at a fairly transitional time. Um, uh, and and it, this may relate in an interesting way. Um, I've been around Silicon Valley for a long time, and I always thought there were like three stages for every company, which is new, hot, and then big. And they're almost completely different. But Google's been big for a long time. And I think there are probably a lot of learnings you got inside of their 
before you punched out to do your own thing. And I'm just wondering if you could give us some insights about what you learned there and and a separate question, I'll be multi-part like Catherine, what is the what is the role of big platforms like like uh like Google and Amazon and um Microsoft for that matter with Azure um going forward? It seems to be we're sort of in an era of maximum big tech and they're starting to move in another direction now, at least from the outside, it looks like that. But the change that you're concerned with are a little bit outside that concern, but I'm just wondering what's happening to big tech. Oh, sure. Yeah. So transition, what did you say? New, hot, and then big? Yeah, new, hot, and big. You get a startup (laughs) and it gets hot if it lives. It gets hot. And then you plateau. You're big now. And it's like a whole other a whole other thing. Very few companies manage those things the same way or with the same leaders or the same people. Mm-hmm. It's it's sort of an inter- there are sort of state changes that occur, like the stages yeah. of a rocket getting into orbit. Yeah. So I think, you know, I was there for about nine years when I started there. It was 2012, 2013. Uh, and it felt big at that time. Uh, but, you know, I think like 10 times bigger by the time I left. Um, so I don't know what phase it was in at, at either of those times. <laughs> Uh, but I think you know, this kind of ties into the rest of your question on what role do those big platforms play. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that I saw happening there that I think we're still seeing happen throughout the rest of the industry uh, was you know, what motivated a lot of the zero trust and what motivated a lot of this supply chain security work. Um, it was if you if you look back at what was happening in kind of that 2012 2013 timeframe at, at Google and most of these other big companies, um, it was uh, Operation Aurora. Um, the, the kind of be, uh, rise of the beginning of these nation state attacks uh, where persistent threats and really scary security folks were spending lots and lots of time trying to break into companies like Google. Uh, and that was a threat model that most companies weren't really considering at the time, like an actual nation trying to attack you. So that led to huge amounts of innovation and reinventing and rethinking of the way secure systems internally at these companies. Then kind of the rest of that decade, the rest of the, the 2010s, I think, you know, every big, massive kind of hyperscaler company had to deal with that. But unless you were one of them, you probably didn't think about it at a 50 or 100 or you know, even 500 or 1,000 person company. You didn't think or model that um, in your threat models. Uh, but now what we're starting to see is uh, you know, what we saw with, with the SolarWinds attack and what we see with these other um insider compromises happening across companies across the industry is that you don't have to be a hyperscaler to be in those crosshairs. Um, if you're somebody that sells software to somebody that sells software to someone that is one of those hyperscalers or say is the federal government, um, now you're just a couple hops in the supply chain away and everyone is having to start to reckon with that um, in their threat models. It's interesting that um, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going back to what you said earlier about the SSDF, which is provided by NIST, which is a federal government um, institution, and how big a customer they are. And, um, and I'm wondering, what, uh, it, on the outside, I tend to think of the government as a slow mover, just by nature. Um, I worked for a company once that was one of those that supplied $25,000 PCXTs to to the federal government, um, when they have a big buy, they're going to buy, you know, 2 million PCs. <laughs> they're going to be costing more than anybody's paying in the open market for these things. But I, I suspect that the federal government is being much, is much more sophisticated now. And so I'm wondering what, what kind of pull they have and how that in a way drives the market from the demand side. I'm always interested in what the demand sides of markets do to pull better stuff out of suppliers back up a chain, which isn't always a chain because you're getting things, you know, containerized with five or six different locations at once. So it's more like a web, I guess, uh, <laughs> than, than a chain. Yeah, yeah, it's complex. Um, you know, I'm sure the federal government's a lot more advanced now than it was back then. There's definitely pockets, um, you know, there's really modern areas and then there's, you know, areas that are still modernizing. They do have a lot of power, though, on that purchasing side. Like you said, as one of the largest vendors, when they buy something, they buy a lot of it. (laughs) Uh, And they buy a lot of things uh, across the board. Um, Because of the way a lot of this stuff like the SSDF is written, um, it applies recursively, too. 
So if you're trying to comply with a lot of that stuff, you also have to require the same guarantees from your vendors. Um, so it's kind of impossible to get started with, actually, because somebody has to do it first and they can't be compliant until everyone else is. But it will spread pretty fast across the web, just given the size and number of folks that sell software to the government. Do, does, does anybody in the government write software? I'm just wondering if they are, are they, if I go into GitHub and I'm looking around for, for developers that are doing things, or, I mean, I know there are lots of them that are working for a lot of the big companies. We had um, uh, Greg Crow Hartman on here earlier. Um, was one of the alpha maintainers of Linux who talked about all the big companies that, that Linux maintainers work for. Do any work for the government? Or is if they don't just, maybe they don't pay enough. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The government employs a lot of full-time software developers. They also do a lot through contracting. So there's a lot of custom software that gets written for the government, whether it's you know, as a government employee or somebody contracted directly by the government. Yeah. So Catherine, you had something there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I go back to every, you know, I go back to putting myself in the shoes of a developer who doesn't know nearly enough about security, which I think is maybe everybody because security is a complicated topic, and you can never, you know, we're all we're always learning, right? Um, so I'm wondering, you know, to kind of recap some things you said earlier, um, like what what would be the next steps you would recommend for a developer who, who just needs to dig in and understand uh, the risks of the software supply chain security? Where would you recommend uh, those people turn for resources right now? <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, there's a really good intro course from the OpenSSF, actually. Um, ah, yes. I'm exactly I sure how to find the link. But yeah, they do have a bunch of education materials and courses on how to get started. Um, and not just the supply chain security aspects, but just things to think about and things to watch out for as you write your software uh, to help reduce the introduction of security bugs. So yeah, it's a great course. Um, I was able to review it before it was published and really like it and recommend it to lots of folks. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great one I was going to mention. <laughs> the OpenSSF has done a lot of really great work, as you mentioned. I mean, as you mentioned in your post, you know, over, over the last year, especially, um, that or as an organization, they seem to have really uh, kind of um, built up a lot of steam. And uh, maybe that's something you could talk about, too. I mean, so how, you know, how did SIGSTOR go from a project that you co-created to being part of the OpenSSF? What was that process? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's kind of cyclical, actually, because I was also working on getting the OpenSSF started kind of at the same time. The OpenSSF yeah. itself, uh, it's pretty new as well. Um, was it the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. something like that, when it actually got started? Um, so, you know, Sixor was kind of going on in parallel at the same time. And once the OpenSSF got going and got through the pandemic and all of those delays and everything like that, um, it was a natural home. So we were able to, to move it into the OpenSSF. Um, I mean, we, about a year ago now, I can't remember exactly when mm. that was done. Yeah, that's great. It's a great reminder of, um, I don't know, the the nature of organizations like that, where you you pitch in, you pitch in your solutions, and and the the best things kind of bubble up, and and it's a I think a good reminder to go to them for not only training but to get involved where possible. Um, I think, Doc. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just Maybe mindful of the time because uh, we're getting down mm -hmm. toward the end of the show here. So uh, let, let me ask you before we get to our final two kind of control questions or experiment control questions. Um, are there any questions we haven't asked you yet that you'd like to address? I think we covered everything. <laughs> I, I don't think that ever happens. <laughs> but we always think of things after the show's over. Well, let me get to the final two then, which, which are. What are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Ooh, um, I don't really get to, to write much code anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a, a VS Code user when I do write code. Um, and then scripting language, i uh, got to say Bash. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good answer. Bash like seems that. to be... I love it when people I, say I, Bash. Yeah, a lot of people say, I don't want to say it, but it's Bash. And it's, I don't know what's wrong with that. Um, we had Brian Fox in here earlier. It was his favorite too, but he wrote it. <laughs> so, so that so that this has been been great, Dan. We really loved having you on the show, and uh, and I and I apologize for being less prepared and and situated as I would like to be, but um, I think it we went well. 
Kath, Catherine's strong. She <laughs> and she lives this stuff. <laughs> so that always that I helps. Sorry for your ride. So, and we'll have to have you back to talk more about this stuff after the world changes again in the sure. in five minutes. <laughs> So Catherine, how was that for you, man? <laughs> that was great. You know, I, I enjoy, you know, I, people like Dan are, are uh, people that I, I honestly look to. I look to the, his work and, and his peers. And, and those are the people that I, I like to learn from and, um, and, you know, and I'll honestly also spread the word because they're doing a lot of really important work. So I, uh, I was very excited to be part of the conversation to begin with. So I still am, and I hope we can continue it. And I look forward to what what he does next year. Yeah, and I and I, you know, when I saw the topic, I thought, oh my gosh, this is an important topic, and I thought nothing about it. Yeah, yet. it's good. It's um, important stuff. Yeah, so it really yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, what, we um, none of us want none of us want our software to be compromised. I mean, I think <laughs> I think we learned some hard lessons over the last few years, and uh, so so that's that's why this this conversation has really bubbled up, and it's like kind of in the forefront, or it is in my mind. I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I talk about this stuff a lot, but um, but yeah, it's but people are out we, there doing the work. It. I mean, so. I, I'm I'm living it now because my you know my uh, supplier. Oh, of your email email host. My email hosting, yeah. you know, all yeah. is with Rackspace and Rackspace is still down as far as I don't even check anymore. It's they're down, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, the part of it is probably I, I shouldn't say that. I, I don't know if they're actually down. I haven't checked in several days because I've just given it up, you know, but I mean, you may never get it back. <laughs> I never, I never, all I that never mail, that back. Whatever, whatever is in there, maybe go on. maybe being IMAP, I may have it here. I haven't, I've been so busy with other things. I haven't looked, I kind of don't want to look to see if it's here. It's, uh, but yeah. And that was an attack. They got attacked and, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great example. Something in I mean, their supply just, chain wasn't right. And, uh, right. Sure. There are so many, I mean, you know, it's like the, the more complicated software gets, I guess, the more, the greater the attack surface or, you know, number of the vulnerable spots and, and that's why, you know, so many really smart people are scrambling right now to, to come up with solutions and, and again, putting in a lot of work and coming up with some good stuff. So the more we talk well, about the it, the more work is done, all these things. Yeah. I mean, the more variables, the more dependencies, the more the attack yeah. surface turns into a kind of four dimensional polyhedron. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think I, we talked about this in an episode, I think, about the number of dependencies, you know, the, your average piece of software. Um, has is just you know increased tremendously over over time and 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 those the all of those are are opportunities for vulnerabilities i suppose and i don't know in the way that we write software where everything is sort of discreet and and plugged in like a little tower of legos but you just yank a little lego out and thing right it's um <laughs> it's complicated <laughs> It's an XKCD cartoon in all dimensions. Exactly. We love to cite that one. Although I, 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 I'm a little bit cautious because I, I, I worry that it gives open source a bad name, but it is a good one. I think there's a misconception still that open source is something, you know, volunteers and hobbyists, which isn't necessarily true, but, uh, but it is a good XKCD. So. And I think, I think a, a point Dan made early on, which is that 80, 90, 100, close to 100% is now yeah, open yeah, source. Yeah, no, yeah, it's like, it's basically that's, so, that's a, that's software kind of is open source software. That's just the way yeah. it's made. That's the way we make software. Yeah. So I get a little testy. You and I having been around open source for so long and 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 in the role that we were talking about it in, in ways, you know, evangelizing it, promoting it. Um, you know, I'm like, well, and I hear the problem with open source software. I'm like, what? It's not open source. That's the problem. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. It's like the problem with lumber is trees, you know? Well, not really. <laughs> yeah. The problem with air is that we have to breathe it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, and let's get a, a plug in before we go. Ah, plugs. Yes. Yeah. Always. Uh, what can we plug? Uh, we can plug the other podcast that we do. Actually, we <laughs> came up with a really good I do. one. Yeah, that one's a good one. We had a really good one this, this week about chat GPT. And um, I'm looking yeah. forward to a holiday break though. Yeah, and uh, I may yeah, have some too. other things to plug in the new year. I'll just be cryptic about that. You can follow yeah. me on Twitter. And, but actually, don't follow me on Twitter. I hate Twitter today. But follow <laughs> oh, me on Mastodon. Yeah, I can't, it's like 
it's like a, it comes naturally, like the muscle memory. I say Twitter and then I don't mean it. I know. Mastodon. I was Follow thinking, me on I mean, Mastodon. <laughs> Catherine I mean, D I, at Librem one. Um, yeah, but, I'm yeah. A, I'm a, I have a twit one and I have a journal one and I had, a, I've had a number of, I haven't had fully figured out Mastodon yet, uh, but it's starting yeah. to become more useful. To oh, me, it's so great. This is good. It's so much more fun. Yeah. All the open source yeah. nerds are there and it's a good time. And yeah, if you're curious about what I, what I'm up to yeah. and what I might have to plug in the future, that's where to find me. Well, that's great. And, uh, next week, I think we're off, but then we have a, um, uh, a, uh, a round table coming up after that and a lot of good guests. Oh, after yeah, that. Yeah. We're, I think I'm we're on it more and more of them. The so yeah, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're I better show up that square. day. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So until then, everybody, this has been Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles with Catherine, and we'll see you next. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. You already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow is a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there.